Why, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are in the fourth Sunday of Advent looking at this wonderful story of Mary visiting her cousin, Elizabeth, and then singing this really awesome song. I don't know about you guys, but when you guys are ever having like a really good day, do you feel just like singing? Yes. Yes, good. Some people here like to sing. I like to sing occasionally when I'm having a really good day, and one of my favorite songs is Oh Come, Oh Come, Emmanuel. I love that song so much, I actually listen to it all year. All year. doesn't matter if it's July, I'm listening to that song. But there was one day in particular, I was feeling really good, having a good day. The kids are playing nicely this time, and I just felt like singing. And so I just start singing, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. And Zeke goes, Daddy, stop. I'm like, what? You don't want me to sing? No. And ransom captive is right. Daddy, stop. Why don't you want me to sing? No, Daddy, no. That mourns in lowly exile. And he runs up to me, runs up to me, and puts his hand on my mouth and goes, no. I'm like, okay, okay. Rejoice, rejoice. And he's like, no, 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 Dad. I mean, the kid just wanted me to stop singing. And I was like, I got to sing. I just got to sing the praises. I love this song. The next day, I'm humming the song in the car, and I can hear Zeke just in the back seat, in his car seat, just going, <laughs> doesn't know the words, but he's singing too. I got him, I got him. <laughs> Man, sometimes we just got to sing. We just got to sing praises to God, our King. And that's what Mary does today. So far, we set up the stage last week. Mary has been visited by this angel, angel Gabriel, and the angel gives Mary some good news, but also some bad news. See, he tells her, hey, you're going you're gonna to become pregnant. You're going to have, uh, you're going to get birth to the Savior of the world. You're going to name him Jesus. We're going to call him Emmanuel. That's all really good news, right? She gets to be the God bearer. That's awesome. But she asks this question. Okay, Gabriel, how's this going to happen? See, I'm a virgin. And we all know it takes two to tango. She's not married. She's like, how's this going to work? And he's like, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, will foreshadow you, and you will become, be conceived, and you will give birth to Jesus, the Son of God. Again, sounds like great news. But guess what? She is going to have a baby not in the confines of her marriage. People are going to look at her and be like... That Mary, mm-hmm, did you hear what Mary did last week? Oh, she got pregnant. Maybe she's going to be pushed to the outside of society. Her own husband, who she's betrothed to at this moment, has every right to stone her to death. And so although it might be the greatest news ever, you're going to literally be the mom of God. But that carries a lot of weight, connotation, judgment. So Gabriel tells her, hey, go visit your cousin Elizabeth. She's been made pregnant, miraculously been made pregnant to in her old age. Go and visit her and see how God is faithful to her and to you. And Mary says, I am the Lord's servant. May everything that you've said come true. She goes and she visits her cousin. And I love the interaction she has. Because she shows up, and the baby John in her womb leaps for joy because he recognizes who Jesus is and who he had, that he's the Savior of the world. He recognizes, even as a little baby in the womb, leaps for joy. Elizabeth is like, blessed are you. Blessed is the child that you're going to bear. This is so amazing. And Mary, having this kind of confirmation of what God is going to do in her life, being confirmed by her cousin Elizabeth, seeing how God is faithful to Elizabeth and going to bring the forerunner to Christ, seeing how God is faithful to her and going to bring the Savior of the world, she breaks out in song and sings this beautiful song. And it starts by saying, my soul praises the Lord. My spirit rejoices 
It's this beautiful way of Mary not praising the gift, but she praises the Lord. See, Mary, I think, has every right at this point to be able to say, hey, listen, I'm pretty awesome. I'm going to be the mom of God, the God-bearer herself. She has every right. And honestly, if that was me, I probably would brag. Hey, guess what? (laughs) I'm going to be the parent of God, not you, me. But luckily, I'm not Mary for a lot of other reasons, but mainly that one. But she doesn't praise God for the gift to be the mom of God. She praises God for his goodness. Praise the Lord. My spirit rejoices in the Lord. Praise him. That's a humility. That's a humbleness to be able to say it's not about me. It's not even about the gifts that God gives me. And I think a lot of us have that. I think a lot of us have this transactional faith with God. God, I love you when you give me all the things. When I got a full bank account and a full belly and a room roof over my head, man, you are good. But when my bank account is hitting zero, I'm not eating as good as I want to be. My house is in disrepair or I don't have a house. Am I still saying, God, you are good? Or am I going, God, what are you doing? Why aren't you providing for me? Why aren't you doing these things for me? What are you up to? Maybe Christmas for you is an amazing time of year filled with lights and decorations and family and all the food and way too many cookies. But maybe Christmas is a really hard time for you. Maybe Christmas is isolating. Maybe there's reminders of broken relationships. Maybe there's no gifts underneath the tree. And you start to think, God, what are you doing? What is up with you, man? Why aren't you being good to me? But this is what Mary shows us, this act of humility. And this is what humility is. Humility is seeing ourselves rightly compared to the magnificence and the power and the might of God. That's what humility really is, to see that he's God and I'm not. See, Mary says it in her first opening verses. God has shown favor to me. She's looked up, he's looked upon me of lowly estate. Mary recognizes that she's just this young girl, 13 to 15 years old. She comes from nobody. She doesn't have power. She doesn't have riches. She's nothing. And yet God looks at her and goes, yes, that's who the Savior of the world is going to come from. Her. And Mary recognizes that. She says, I I don't deserve this. I haven't earned this. I'm just this lowly girl, and yet God has done something amazing. Again, back to this is the goodness of God and who he is. This great humility. So for you and for me, part of our struggle, I think, in this time of year is to be humble, especially when you're thinking about all the gifts you're going to get. Oh, I deserve all those gifts, man. I deserve the best gifts because I'm a pretty awesome person. But gift giving is just out of the generosity of our hearts, right? Gift giving is only because God has given so generously to us and we want to do the same generosity back. But it takes a humbleness for us to say, it's not about me. It's not about what I've done. It's not about what I deserve. It's the generosity of the people around me. It's the goodness of them. But mainly it's the goodness of God. As Mary continues in the song, she says that God gives mercy to those who fear him. God gives mercy to those who fear him. And I was thinking about it. When I was growing up, my mom had three kids in a year and a half. God bless her. But I remember if we were acting out, 
if me and my twin brother were getting up into all sorts of business and things we shouldn't have been doing and my sister was getting dragged along, my mom would say, hey, don't make me tell dad. No, <laughs> don't tell dad. Please, please don't tell dad. Now I want to tell you guys, my dad, he's six foot three, he's bigger than I am. The guy could probably take off my head if he wanted to. He's never, ever in his lifetime ever set a finger on me, ever. He's never had to beat me, whip me, none of that. But man, my mom could threaten dad. <laughs> don't, let me don't make me tell dad. No, 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 please don't, please don't, please don't. He's the kindest, gentlest, most loving man I've ever met in my entire life. Yet there was a fear. Because I knew that if he really wanted to, he could pop my head off my shoulders. That's kind of what the fear we're talking about. That's kind of the fear we have with God. God, you are big and strong and mighty. And you could, if you wanted to, bring down destruction. You could, if you wanted to, destroy everything. But it's not just this respect of who he is and what he can do, but also this, this awe and wonder that we have. It's like when you show up to the Grand Canyon. You're sitting there on the edge, you're looking in this big hole. Is anybody there saying, look, I'm the most beautiful person in the world. I got a doctorate in English. Now everyone's looking at that hole and going, wow, can you believe it? God carved this hole out of water? This is amazing. I am so small compared to the magnificence and might and power of this Grand Canyon. That's what it's like for you and I to get into the presence of God and say, I'm just a small little person who seems insignificant, who seems it doesn't matter. But here's the really good thing. God wants to show his power and his glory. He wants to show that. And he does that because he looks at Mary and says, you're small, you're insignificant, you don't matter, you think you're nothing, but I'm going to do something really awesome and great and amazing with you. And he's done this over and over and over again in the Bible. Take David, King David, for example. When they were trying to pick the next king, the prophet was going, he knew that he was going to pick the next king. He was going to Jesse's house to pick that man. And he said, bring out all your sons. And Jesse brings out his sons. He goes, nope, 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 not that one. You got any more sons? Yes, I do. It's David. He's out in the sheep, though. For whatever reason, Jesse didn't even bring David out. Because he was too young, too small, didn't matter. I don't know. But his own dad didn't pick him. But God says, yes. That's the one. That's who I want. God also picks Moses when he's 80 years old to go back to Egypt and let his people go, to wander the desert for 40 years. All you 80-year-olds, can you imagine? Camping every single day in the desert. That's who God sees. That's what God looks at and says, yes, them. I'm going to pick the Savior of the world through Mary. I'm going to pick the forerunner through Christ, through Elizabeth and Zechariah, who were old and have never had kids. I'm going to do great things because God loves to show his glory and his power. And he picks the small and the insignificant and the weak and the things that we discard as a world that doesn't matter. He picks them and says, I'm going to use them. So if you feel small and insignificant this Christmas... If you feel alone and you don't matter, God has said, I'm doing great things for you and through you and with you. Look at what I've done with Mary and David and Moses and Elizabeth. Make you sing songs of praise because I am good. But friends, oftentimes I find our humility is not what we actually bring to the table, but often our pride. And this is what pride is. Pride is what happens when, we, we, when you think that you are a better God than God is. Just calling it straight today. You think that you can God better than God can. You think you got it all together. You think you can do the things better. You think you can do all this. 
You think you've earned your own way to salvation. You don't need his help. You don't need the lowly savior born in a manger. You can do just fine on your own. That, my friends, is pride. And pride leads to all sorts of terrible things. Martin Luther, on his commentary on the Mendificat, the song that Mary sings, he points out three things that, he, that pride often highlights in our life and what it can lead to. And the first is this. When we have a pride in our own wisdom, that leads us to be unmerciful. When we, when we value our intellect and our knowledge and our understanding and what we decide and what we do, we can look at other people and go, man, that person over there is living in sin. I can't believe they made that decision. Can you believe it? I'd never do that. I'd never make that decision. I'd never do the thing that they were doing. But you didn't grow up how they grew up. You don't have their perspective. You don't know why somebody does the things that they do or the struggles that they have. But when we think we know, when we think we have it all together, when we think that we have our pride is so wrapped up in our own wisdom, we become unmerciful. Because we can't actually give mercy for things we don't understand. But we think in our pride that we have it. We think we know when we don't know. We gotta quit acting like God because you don't know. The second thing Luther points out, he says that our, our pride in our, in our power will lead to us being unjust. Because again, we look at somebody over there and say, man, they got the struggle with sin. I can't believe that. That's easy for me. I don't struggle with alcohol like they do. I don't struggle with whatever like they do. Why can't they just do better, right? Just give a little bit more effort and you'll be able to conquer the things in your life. But it doesn't work that way. And it leads you to be unjust. Because you think that all your power and all your might will help you, but maybe it doesn't work the way for them. And that pride can put you in a really hard spot. The last thing that Luther says is that we have this, this pride in our, in our riches. And that leads us to our unrighteousness. Because we start to look at all the things in our life, we start to look at well, I got all this and I got all that, and man, am I pretty awesome. I worked really hard. I got lots of money. I got lots of stuff. I got lots of things. You start to look at it and go, yep, you know what? I did that. I did all that. And that'll lead us to our own unrighteousness because we start to equate the gifts of God as we deserve those or that we earned those, and it never works that way. We'll start to look at our own salvation of Jesus who's come as a baby to die on a cross, to die and be laid in a tomb and then rise three days later. We'll look at that and say, yeah, I'd save myself too. I'm pretty awesome. I got all this stuff. Clearly, I'm good enough to be saved. You're not. You're not. We all deserve the punishment. We all deserve every last bit of wrath. There's two books in our scriptures that I think are helpful for us in this time of year when we think about pride and humility. And that's the book Job and Ecclesiastes. I love Job because Job is this, this, this man who's got everything he has. He has everything he could possibly imagine in his life. He's got house and animals and, and family, and it's all taken away. All of it taken away within a week. And still he says, the Lord gives and takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And yet you got Ecclesiastes over here, and you got Solomon, who's the king, who has all the riches and the glory and the power and the women. He's got everything. And he says, it's all vanity. It's all vanity to compare to knowing God. Now, I think most of us land somewhere in the middle, right? Not everything's been taken away from our life. We have nothing. But also, I don't think any of you guys are cajillionaires. We're kind of in the middle. But we can see this and go, you know what? If I have nothing, blessed be the name of the Lord. If I have everything, it doesn't matter. I'm blessed because I have the Lord. But if you're one of those people that maybe you struggle with pride, maybe you struggle with being humble, here's the good news of Christmas. Christ has come for you. 
He's come to redeem those things, to restore those things, to take those things that you struggle with, that you're, that, you're, that you're sitting in and you think it's all about you, but it's not. He takes those things and says, hey, I have something better for you. Me. Me as a baby. Me who's come to, to take on every single experience that you have experienced. I take that on. I understand it. I get it. I'm walking with you. I'm going to fulfill all of the promises, not just one, all of them. I'm here with you. I'm helping to transform and change you. And I died for you and rose for you. So you can be free from the, the bondage of sin. You can be free from the clutches of the devil. And you can be free from death itself. That's what Christmas is all about. Christ has come to be here, to dwell with, to sit with us, to live with us, and to reign over us. So my prayer for you this Christmas season is not to be made mighty and powerful and have all the stuff and things. My prayer for you is to be made lowly and humble and weak so that God's glory can shine and his mercy can be put into my life so we too can be just like Mary and sing praises to the Lord. And just as we hear her song, where she's singing Jesus to our ears, she sings to us and tells us, Jesus, the Savior of the world, has come. He's come for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a God who has come to meet us in the muck and the mire and all the, the decay and the hurt and the pain and the sin, and yet you've come into this world to take it all on to die for it, to rise for it, and be victorious over all of it. Lord, may we cling to you in this time. May we see the manger that points to the cross. And may we cling to the cross of Christ, praising you and your goodness, not the gifts, but you and your goodness, and how your goodness has been promised to us, how you are faithful to us, how you are bringing all of us home. Lord, we await for when you come again. Be with us. And may we sing praises each and every day. Praises to you. Lord, we love you. We pray all this in your great and your beautiful name. Amen.